Welcome to the Philip Wiley Show. Take a look behind the curtain of professional hacking and hear compelling discussions with guests from diverse backgrounds who share a common curiosity and passion for challenges and their job. And now, here's your host, offensive security professional, educator, mentor, and author, Philip Wiley. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Philip Wiley Show. Today I'm excited to be joined by Lynn No. Uh, if you are a frequent conference goer, then you've probably seen Lynn speaking and uh, he does some really cool stuff. And beyond just the normal hacking, this guy kind of hacks himself. And we're going to kind of get into the details of that in his upcoming book. So welcome to the show, Lynn. I really appreciate your time, Phil. I'm happy to be here. Long time oh, listener, great. first time, first time contestant. Thanks. Great to have you on. I've been been meaning to have you on, but just like a lot of other things, you know, just as as you would know, trying to find guests, being part of the cybersecurity community, it's not hard. It's just remembering to get people scheduled, and so that's typically what happens with me. So fortunately, we finally got you got you scheduled. I really appreciate the time, man. I I, I love how you your podcast going. Like I said, I've been I, you're on my rotation, so oh, that's an honor. Thanks. Thanks. So before you started, I like for listeners to share their hacker origin story. So if you wouldn't mind sharing your hacker origin story. It's weird because I kind of have two. You know, the, the first one is honestly, I, I was messing around with a Commodore 64. And, you know, I'm going to carve and date myself here. You know, this was back <laughs> before the internet, before even token rings or you know, any of that stuff. And, you know, this was, you know, back when you bought your computer at like Montgomery Wards, you know, you bought it at, at the big, you know, mall. And, you know, that back then there wasn't any real internet or ways to share files except for sneaker net, at, you know, and we were still on five and, a, five and a half inch floppies. So my first hack was honestly, I was coding a Frogger style video game that came to me and I think it was called Commodore Monthly, but it was, it was a monthly magazine. And I inadvertently had coded myself a God mode, you know, like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I put one instead of a zero, you know, after I had in one line of script and it, it just clicked for me that what was, that was the one where it was like, I understood that the stuff that was going on in the background had the direct correlation to what was going on in the front. So that is what I would consider my first hack, but my first network hack was actually in my junior year of high school, and I was part of the drafting uh, vocational class. I was trying to be a draftsman, you know, computer-aided design, and we were, this was before the entire school was networked. It was still Windows. And uh, three one one for work groups, and you know when you go into class in the morning, you log into the 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 map drive for you that was on the the, the teacher's computer, and you grab your daily workload, and then you put it back at the end of the day. Well, I discovered by looking around, you know, basically the old version of Network Neighborhood, found my my instructor's box, and there were more folders on there including all of the tests for the rest of the year. So I actually made a really good side hustle by selling off exams for the, the, the CAD program to all three years. And I did that <laughs> all the way through my, my high school career. So that would be my first computer hack and my first network hack. Very interesting. So yeah, if you couldn't kind of wouldn't mind sharing kind of like your professional career, kind of where, how you got into doing what you're doing now. That's kind of a, a really unique story because I didn't come to security the way that most people do. You know, you've been around the scene for a long time. You know that meme that you always see? There's two paths to getting into security. Either you go to school, then you go to college, you know, you get a degree in computer science. Or you just decide to be a criminal for a long time, you get arrested, and then when you come out, everybody wants to hire you. So I never got arrested for any type of cyber crime, but I came to the ways of cybersecurity via the black hat route. I was an active member of the 
worst of the worst types of, of motorcycle clubs in, in the U.S. for the better part of my middle ages. So I was riding with motorcycle clubs, and I was a system administrator for a very large human resource and payroll company whose name I will not mention. So uh, you know, I, I never, I as as a security professional now, I, I really did find it really amusing that I remember riding my motorcycle to this company while wearing full, you know, motorcycle club colors and hanging my colors in my cubicle in Cubeland. The fact <laughs> that this, you know, I was never even looked at as a potential threat kind of makes me wonder about, you know, how security was done back then. But yeah, I, I came to the security by way of having grandchildren. You know, I, I kind of came to that point in my life where it was, you know, the only things I was really good at was working on computers, being a system admin or an architect, which is boring. And I was still living a double life. I was on IT during the day, and I was spending all my nights running around on a motorcycle acting like something out of Sons of Anarchy. And then I had my first grandchild. And it was like, okay, you got to make some choices. And it was at that moment that I realized that I didn't make a change in my own behavior. My kids and my grandchildren, they were going to be meeting me from behind bars at a minimum. So I just took my first cybersecurity job with CyberArk, and, you know, the rest has been history. You know, I came into there, the organization as just a sales engineer, but, you know, I was able to take my past and turn it from something that I was actually quite ashamed of and able to use it for a positive moving forward. Very cool. And that's, that's a good story too. Those stories need to be shared with folks that they can see that they can turn things around because there's some, some people, unfortunately that, you know, get in trouble with the law and it makes it hard for them to get jobs. But, you know, and just for the fact to show people that there are legitimate ways to use those skills without Absolutely. putting yourself at risk of, of any kind of criminal background. You know, and the truth is this way is so much more fun. You know, I get to do all of the same kind of, of attacks, you know, research, you know, we'll just call it what it is, hacks, because, you know, that's like, you know, the cookie for us is, you know, getting that credential. I can still do it, but I don't have to worry about state-funded vacations. You know, they, the, <laughs> the amenities suck. The beds are terrible. There's no pool. You know, the rooms are, are just horrific. You know, but I, if you hear it, I... I really do enjoy educating people on a lot of the things that they don't see as a threat. And one of the things that I've found in my own life is, you know, the old adage of it takes a, uh, it takes a thief to catch a thief. You know, everybody in our, our industry always talks about how, you know, we need to think like an attacker. We need to think like the bad guys. I don't have to think like the bad guys. I just have to think. You know, I, I live that life, so it's not thinking like somebody else. That's just how I naturally see the, the world. I, the minute I walk into a room, whether I, you know, it doesn't matter where I am. Where's the cameras? Where are the exits? You know, where can I sit where nobody can get behind me? It's just ingrained in me at this point. So, so what all types of things are you currently doing in your day job? I'm doing a lot of, you know, evangelism work for for the company you know cyber you know i just got back from doing uh some presentations down in australia had an amazing reception you know i went there and actually presented the new version of my biohacker talk so you know i knew we were going to get to this eventually but you know for those that may not know like like phil said earlier i have what is known as a transhuman so this has nothing to do with my orientation or anything like that. This is basically, I have taken actual technology and currently I have 10 different microchips that are implanted inside my body from my elbows to my fingertips. I can interface directly with NFC, RFID. I have a magnet. I even had a credit card in my hand for a while that unfortunately the company went out of business. But, you know, there's nothing funnier than just walking up to some point of sale system, just smacking your hand on it, and, and it pays. You know, people think you're some kind of a weird magician. Yeah, that's 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 pretty interesting. I'm sure there's some ways you could leverage that type of thing and, and like, magic acts and stuff. 
<laughs> it's actually a, a, a magician based out of Las Vegas that actually has a lot more implants than I than I do. Uh, I believe she's got, I think, 56 of them. And that's part of her entire act. And this woman actually won Magician of the Year, I think, back in uh, 2019, 2020. And most of her tricks are actually technology enabled through the microchips in her body. So, you know, there are amazing functions. You know, I mean, you look like you're you're pretty on the ball. Are you, are you one of the, the EV guys, Phil? electronic vehicle no actually want to get one just haven't gotten around to it just kind of wanting to make sure that uh there's plenty of places to charge and all that stuff because i had experience last year i spoke at a, a conference at, at uh bloomfield university i believe it was in pennsylvania and rented an AV, ev just to kind of see what it's like and one of the things you really have to be better at planning with an ev than you do a gasoline vehicle because you can fill up quickly anywhere with a gasoline vehicle, but you get out somewhere, especially when it's kind of out in a rural area, it's a little more difficult to find those charging stations. And that's kind of one of the things that's kind of held me back. My car's mileage is not too bad, so my next next vehicle may be EV. Well, the reason I ask is if you're going for a Tesla, there's actually one approach that you can get where you can put your Tesla valet key on your white your implant and actually just get in the car and go. Oh, wow. So, yeah, there's a lot of really cool features coming out in terms of the enhancements of, of human beings. You know, my shtick is the fact that I just found a way to weaponize them. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that these this specific attack vector is not even on anyone's radar. And, and that's one of the things that I find really surprising. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because you can just imagine. I couldn't imagine. It's hard to believe nation states not considering something like this because you're going in somewhere, you have to go through, you have to your pockets, go through mm -hmm. these searches and x-rays and stuff. And if you have anything in your pockets or whatever, you know, some situations, a lot of situations, especially if it's like government, you can't even take your phone in. Mm -hmm. And so you have to leave that outside. I remember being here in Dallas, interviewing with a consulting company, several bits been over 12 or 14 years ago now, just going in that place. I couldn't take my cell phone in for the interview. I had to put it in a locker. So can yeah. you just imagine this type of technology, what kind of edge that gives spies or nation states? Oh, absolutely. There's, I've actually got an article coming out this week in the Hill in DC on that exact topic is, you know, if we're not on the, when I say we, I mean, you know, augmented humans, if we're not on the government radar at this point, you know, here, here's a shocking fact, Phil. My implants are actually looked at the exact same way as an ear piercing. They're looked at as body jewelry. This is the only body jewelry that has to conform to the regulations of the federal, uh, the FCC, you know, but nobody's looking at them for what they are. These are just as dangerous as any other particular attack vector, and in, in a lot of ways, even more so. I mean, one of the, the attacks that I debuted at RSA back in, in 2021 was the physical aspect of these types of attacks. Between two chips that I have in my body, I can interface to almost 320 different physical access control systems. Prox, HID 1, 2, and 3, and DALA, Pyramid. You know, and if I can skin your badge and write it down to one of these implants, now we bring in the other aspect of being transhuman and how this is even really more dangerous from a security perspective. All of these are inside my body, so therefore they're covered under the HIPAA protection laws of, of medical. So even if somebody was to say, catch me, you know, in an, uh, let's say I, I skinned your badge, I get into your data center. You know, but the scenario would be what? Your operations are going to grab me. They're going to take me into an office. They're going to call the police. Police are going to show up. They're going to search. I don't have anything that would show intent to commit a crime. They, they won't find a clone badge. They won't find a Proxmark or a Flipper or anything like that. They're going to have to let me go. 
Mm -hmm. And the fact that I have 10 microchips total, if you have any type of IoT that's interfacing over NFC or RFID, I can attack those directly through physical contact. Yeah, and they're not even going to have a clue that you have these implants. And they're not even allowed to ask about it. And yeah. that's what makes it even worse. You know, I'm actually using the health and privacy laws that we have here in the United States and GDPR over in Europe to actually protect my tools. So you ever run into any issues at airports or anything? Not a one. You know, and, and the one thing that I wanted to, to clarify is, you, you know, the scanners that we see in all of the airports, those are not x-rays. Those are body scanners. So they're not actually looking inside the body. They're looking between the clothing and the mass of, of the person. So they can't actually find them. And the truth is, even if they did, the TSA agents or, or whoever security in whatever country, they're still limited. I mean, I'm, I, once again, I'm showing I'm old, but you know, I, I have an, an actual medical implant done back in February. I had my left knee replaced. And I learned something after that. I always thought that that card that they give people who have like a hip replacement, a knee replacement, whatever, that, you know, you're supposed to give that to the TSA and it gives them the understanding, that, oh, this person has this. That is completely useless. They actually have a template for that on, on the TSA website. The procedure is the same whether you have the card or you don't. So once you understand what they're able to do, there's, you know, it's very easy to basically pin them into that health and privacy corner, and there's nothing more you have to say than it's medical. You know, one, of the, one thing that I, I was not able to actually get the answer to this before the book was released, and I'm hoping that once it comes out, there will be some organization that wants to take me up on this offer. But one of the things that I've been researching is, is are you familiar with the technology sniffing canines that are being used in uh, law and military? No. Okay. So everybody's pretty familiar with drug smelling dogs and bomb dogs and cadaver dogs. Well, there's a new type of canine that's being used by law enforcement, and they're a technology smelling dog. So the use case is a little bit different. They're actually have been trained to sit on a chemical compound called triphenylphosphine oxide, which is one of the main chemicals used in circuitry and hard drive development and manufacture. So these dogs are used a lot in human trafficking and pedophilia cases where after an arrest is made, they'll take these dogs as part of a search warrant and look for thumb drives or portable hard drives. I'm wondering if they may be the only non, how do I want to say this? The non, non legally dangerous way to detect somebody like me. Due to those health and privacy laws, there's not a lot that law enforcement or security officers would be able to do because in order to actually detect someone like me, you would first need full spectrum analyzers that are listening on every possible frequency at every entrance to a, a building to locate us. So I'm hoping to find out if one of these tech dogs would be able to smell the technology through the skin like they can with drugs and other objects, foreign objects. Very beautiful. And, and the weird thing is, is if you remember back to the Terminator movie, whenever the, wherever the rebels were, they always had dogs because they could smell the differences between the Terminators and the real humans. So this may be one of those weird situations where art is really going to wind up imitating life. Yeah. So have you heard of any cases where someone is actually using this maliciously, any kind of nation states or cyber criminals using this type of technology? In terms of criminals, no. But I do know of about three professional red teamers and pen testers that are using them actively in engagements. And the trouble comes in where, it, even from a logging or a VFIR perspective, 
you know, let's say, I, let's use the example I had already given you in terms of the physical access. You can go back to your access controller and you'll be able to see that something happened. You, there's, there'll be a log of somebody's car. Then you can go to your video footage, your, your closed circuit TV and your, your security feeds. And all you're going to see is my hand going up and opening the door. So the idea that these should then use, if I've been able to show now five different unique attacks with these. I have no doubt in my mind that they have been used maliciously. The only difference is there's no way to actually identify the original source of it and the contactless trigger. Interesting. So these kind of implants, is, are there any kind of MAC addresses that can be detected? You know, how we can detect they MAC can be, addresses of different hardware types to see the source where it came from? They can be changed. You can change okay. the the block zero on a lot of these and give it any unique plain air buyer as long as it fits within the naming convention. So my hopes are that, you know, through amazing, you know, podcasts like yours, along with the upcoming book, we can open up the eyes of the general population to the existence of a subspecies that's been here since the 60s. The only difference is we're now at a point where normally the people that would be doing things like I'm doing have been kind of relegated into the, the body modification extreme, you know, and the truth is that particular style of person typically doesn't interface with high level executives very often. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen, but they travel in two different, you know, lanes. The difference is I'm taking something from a taboo type of a subculture and I'm basically forcing it on the rest of society because of its ability to integrate with the technology at hand. So what got you interested in this? How did you find out about this type of stuff? Well, I've been a, I've been a fan of body modification for a long time. And, and I say, you know, those crazy people that do body modification extreme things but one of my hobbies is actually doing flesh hook suspensions and being hung from a ceiling. So there was, I remember back around 2015, 2016, there was a group called Grindhouse Wetwear out of Pennsylvania. And they came out with some of the first consumer style implants. Uh, there was the, the Firefly, which was an internal battery. You know, it had, I think, three to six LEDs. And once it was implanted under the skin, it kind of made you look like Iron Man and it would blow through your skin. You know, and then there was also people who were putting tritium gas in a vial under the skin so the skin would glow great. You know, I have my septum pierced, I've had my tongue pierced. So the idea of augmenting myself is, you know, not, not really something foreign. You know, I, if you've ever seen me, you know, I, get to, I tell people I have one tattoo. It just starts at my neck and goes all the way to my feet. <laughs> you know, but the idea of all of those are kind of early onset implants. I, I, at that point in my life, I was still a black hat. So the idea of doing something that was going to draw attention to me, and it, it really didn't suit my needs. Plus, you know, those original implants, they were basically there for show. They had no real input-output capabilities. So I basically relegated people like me, me now to the, you, you, you don't really have a valid use case or purpose. And it was a couple of put about back in 2020, I believe it was, right after they started loosening up the pandemic restrictions. I was sitting in the Netherlands and hanging out at a tattoo parlor. Like I said, these are my kind of people. You know, and I, I, I like to get stickers from tattoo parlors. And there was a guy in tattoo shop there in Amsterdam that was talking about another parlor, one train stop down in Utrecht, that actually had injectable RFID and NFC chips. And it was a like, Okay, now we actually have something that's worth research. You know, there's NFC built into almost every mobile device out there. The amount of RFID terminals, receivers out there is just phenomenal. This is an attack landscape. You know, and then when I started looking into it, it just started to snowball. And 
I found out that there is actually a consumer grade distributor based right here in the United States. They're called dangerousthings.com. They're based out of Seattle, Washington, and they have pretty much every kind of passive style implant that you can imagine. You know, if you want to, you want to swap out one of your fobs to get into work with an implant, you can do it. You know, the, the one, they have one family of chips called the Vivo key, which, you know, I've been talking about this for a couple of years in it, especially in security circles. This is actually a chip that I used to actually help secure my digital presence. So for OTPs, you got, you, you know, your, I'll just throw Duo or Microsoft Authenticator or Google Authenticator, any of those. You know, those are pretty common. I have to actually scan an implant before it'll even let me get to my OTP codes. And then unlike most of them where after the 60 second clock for that particular code runs down, instead of just popping another one up, I have to rescan my implant. I've got my crypto key tied to it, not one, this particular implant. You know, so this to me is looking more forward where not only are transhumans a threat, but the ability to augment your, your physical self may actually help secure your digital identity as well. Pretty interesting. Yeah, that's pretty wild. I'm definitely a, a step off the reservation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty interesting because I, I said on one of your talks that you said kind of a while back, and one of the implants you had, wasn't it like something that had like an operating system like Kali Linux embedded on one of those? No, no, I don't have okay. that one yet. That's okay. actually been a labor of love and a project I've been working on for going on 18 months now. So there was, uh, I'm sure you remember back then, kind of towards the onset adoption of, of high-speed internet in Europe, there was a, an application slash firmware that you could pop onto a standalone TP-Lite router called the Pirate Box. Okay. Yeah, I remember that. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. So, yeah, the Pirate Box was basically a logless file transfer and it was meant to help get around copyright laws around swapping videos and movies and music well there was a project called the peg leg which took the pirate box concept put it onto a raspberry pi zero w added an, a little bit of a larger external wi-fi adapter to it and then they would basically coat this thing in two-part epoxy uh, with also, I forgot, there was an, inver uh, an inversion power receiver that would be added to it. Then they would cover it in epoxy and actually implant it in their legs just above where the front pants pocket is. That way they could take a battery pack with inversion powering technology, slide that into their pocket, and then they can have this stateless kind of swap location for files. I was taking their idea and rather than turning using the pirate box software, I wanted to put Cali Linux on. Well, as I was for then going through and working on prototypes, I've tried the Raspberry Pi 0 W2. I've tried the Raspberry Pi Pico board. I had issues because one of the things I want to do with my particular version of this, because if I'm gonna stick this in my leg, this is not something I can make easy updates to. I wanted to dual Wi-Fi at a minimum so that I could do Wi-Fi pineapple attacks, rogue AP attacks. And I didn't really like the options I was getting to Raspberry Pi. So I'm currently working with a KiCad designer and we're actually designing an SVC for the purpose of being an implant for offensive security. It's the plan is they have dual Bluetooth, as well as dual Wi-Fi. And I've even gone so far as to looking into what it would take to, and for any trigger warning for anybody that thinks gory stuff is bad, fast forward about 20 to 30 seconds. <laughs> um, I've actually looked at possibly encapsulating some copper wire and actually making an incision from about the mid thigh on the outside of my leg up to just down on to the calf 
and actually running wire down my leg to act as an actual antenna for the Pi or, huh. or for the, the SBC just to get additional range. Very cool. <laughs> Pretty interesting stuff. So th there are very many people collaborating with you or that are doing these type of things that you're able to, to get resources from or collaborate with. Actually, the CEO of Dangerous Things, Amal Garofstra, has been, you know, an amazing, you know, uh, connection that I've made. Uh, additionally, I've actually gotten a hold of, like, Tim O'Shea, uh, Rich Lee, basically the, the original grinders from Grindhouse Wetware. I've been in contact with those guys, and they've been a big help. And I'm actually looking forward to going to Grindfest next year. You know, nothing like, you know, having to fight each other with taser swords just as part of the program. <laughs> yeah, they can make for some interesting games when you have that stuff built in. It really does. <laughs> you know, and, and I'll tell you what, just having a magnet in your pinky makes for some really cool bar tricks. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, especially you get into a bar and people have been drinking, they think they're oh, seeing yeah. things. Yeah. Bottle caps, you know, you just pick them up, with your with your pinky and it just hangs there and you know i i've had a lot of fun in bars i bet yeah someone would think you're an next man <laughs> okay, I'll Mut mutant. yeah <laughs> so yeah why don't we kind of get into your book because you've got a book that's coming out pretty soon hacked human my life and lessons is the world's first augmented ethical hacker so why yeah. don't you kind of tell us about your book well, the book is kind of one part autobiographical and the second part explanation. You know, how do I put this? You know, you don't just wake up one day and go, you know, today seems like the perfect day to start shoving electronics in my body. You know, it's definitely a progression. You know, it started with, you know, it's blank ear piercing when I was in junior high, which led to, you know, multiple body piercings, tattoos, flesh hook suspensions. And, you know, you kind of got to build up to the point where you, you realize that, at least from my perspective, my body is here for me to do whatever I want with. And, you know, I have no intention of turning this body in at the end and it being well-preserved and, you know, looking pristine. I'm, I, I'm going to be that guy that, you know, oh, what, you can cut your arm off and put on a robot arm? I volunteer. <laughs> but, you know, it's a little bit you know, about around the psychological issues that I have in order to think that this was a good idea. It goes into a little bit of how, you know, I got into the motorcycle clubs. I don't go into a lot of details of things I've done there just due to statute of limitations. You know, I, I, I think the way I phrased it in the book was I was there, things were done, move on. But it brings out a lot in terms of what we're seeing in the, the wild today. I mean, if you open up the news, you're, we're, we're hearing about brain computer interfaces, Neuralink, you know, Synchron. We're hearing about, you know, all these medical innovations. And, you know, then you get things like the 2045 project, which has nothing to do with politics, but all about the idea that the running, we'll call it the catchphrase is that we as human beings should be able to download our consciousness to a digital format by the year 2045. And where this is all going, you know, I, I try to demystify, you know, a lot of what people think about augmented humans. You know, we do not have the ability to put GPSs in people, at least from a consumer base. You know, I, I actually spent a, quite a bit of time going over the COVID vaccines. You know, and no, you are not getting microchip during you, when you were getting a vaccine. And I actually break it down into how I can prove it. For example, the needle that you need to have to get an implant of technology is about the size of a pen. I guarantee you, the first person that went in for a vaccine, if somebody came out with something this big and said, we're going to put this in your arm for, and, you know, this is going to give you a vaccine. There would have been nobody getting a vaccine. Yeah, I agree. On top of the fact that you can feel the microchips under your skin. So yeah, we do a lot. I do a lot of debunking. 
And then I, one of the things that I, I really tried to do is just get people to take a look at how we have moved the lines of social acceptability for things that used to be considered taboo. You know, I go back and look into, you know, a lot of old practices, you know, foot binding out of Asia, the chopping off of the last digit of your pinky as in Asia and some parts of Italy. You know, we can come a long way from the idea of every professional needs to look and act a certain way. But if we really want to get to that utopian future that everybody's talking about and living forever in a digital form, we're going to have to do some real questions about our concepts of ethics and morality around what is considered medical and what is considered not. Because a lot, when it comes to the, a lot of this new technology that's integrating into the nervous system and the brain computer interfaces, these are reserved currently for the worst physical condition people out there. I mean, they're not, they're not meant for the Elon Musks and the Jeff Bezos and the Bill Gates and the Phil Wileys and the Len Nose. You know, they're meant for people that are quadriplegic. They're meant for people that are shut in. So if we want to become the, the next digital frontier, we first have to define how this is going to play with medical ethics, because the hypocritic oath is to do no harm. So, I mean, we've got, there's a lot packed into this book in terms of where we are now, where the future is going, and see concerns that if we don't make some changes as a society, what this dystopian future may actually look like based on the technology of today. Yeah, very, very interesting stuff. So we're, we're getting down towards the end of the episode. Is there anything you'd like to share before we close it out? Just that, you know, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Again, the name of my book is Human Hack. My life and lessons is the world's first augmented hacker, ethical hacker. Um, if you're going to be down in uh, hacker summer camp next week in Vegas, come look, find me. Um, I'll be there during DEF CON. Look forward to seeing everybody. Thank you, Bill, for the time. And uh, I look forward to seeing, hooking up with you at you SecCon, man. First yeah. time's on me. Same here, and, and I'll be at Hacker Summer Camp next week, so maybe we'll run into each other there. Sounds so, great. Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I appreciate the opportunity, man. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to The Philip Wiley Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, to learn more about Philip, go to thehackermaker.com and connect with him on LinkedIn and Twitter at Philip Wiley. Until next time.